If you lift weights, I'm willing to bet at one point or another, you aspired to look like someone specific. It happened for me when I was in high school. I was watching the movie Thor with my girlfriend and her dad, but I noticed the entire time she would not stop staring at him. And I don't mean low-key staring either. This girl's eyes were target-locked onto this man's biceps. Here, babe, you look really thirsty. Whoa, look at that guy's arms. Oh my God. That night, I'm not ashamed to admit it. I printed off a picture of Chris Hemsworth, stuck it beside my bathroom mirror, and my lifting journey began. Notice we never pick semi-muscular idols. If we're going to put ourselves through the pain of working out, we set our sights not just high, but at the very peak of what is humanly possible. Logically, this means when we work out, we aren't happy with just some muscle gain. We want to get the most muscle gain possible out of our workout. This way, every day we can make the most progress towards our goal. This is actually a very common goal. Strength athletes such as powerlifters, American football linemen, and shot putters care about maximizing their muscular development because there's a well-proven and direct correlation between muscle cross-sectional area, aka size, and strength output. While muscle size isn't the only factor to influence strength, it is one of the most important. Bodybuilders who are judged on their muscular development and symmetry also have a reason to care about getting maximum muscular development. Over time, personal trainers and coaches have developed a variety of specialized training techniques, things you can mix into your training which, according to Jim Lore, will help with that goal of maximizing your muscle gains. If you spent much time in a gym, odds are you've heard of some of them. These tricks like performing heavy negatives, drop sets, supersets, and forced reps have all been touted as ways to get even more muscle growth out of your workouts. But are they really better than just training the usual way in normal sets and reps? Well, luckily, there's research on this topic. Over the next few videos, we're going to be taking a look at that research, figuring out if these techniques are really effective, and if so, how and when to properly implement them into your training so we can all hit that goal and maximize our muscle growth. Today, we start with looking at heavy negatives. Quick physio lesson. When you lift a weight, use a machine, or do a bodyweight exercise, the rep can be broken into three parts. First is the concentric portion. This is the part of the rep where your muscle is contracting and becoming shorter. During this portion, you're usually moving either a weight or your own body against gravity. In a bicep curl, the concentric portion is lifting the weight up. In a push-up, well, it's the up part. It is called concentric because your fibers are in the process of contracting. What happens though if you pause anywhere through the range of motion and just hold the weight? Well, your muscles are no longer continuing to get shorter, so it isn't concentric. This is the second part of a rep and is called an isometric contraction. If you pause at the top of a bicep curl or the bottom of a push-up, you're contracting your muscles isometrically. Some exercises are just one long isometric contraction. A plank is a great example of this. Whereas during regular reps, some people skip this portion altogether and switch direction almost instantly. But most importantly for this video is the eccentric portion, also sometimes called the negative. This is the part of the exercise where the target muscle lengthens. Some see this as the easy part. Imagine lowering the weight back down from a bicep curl. Your muscle is lengthening, but although you are working with gravity, your muscle is still doing something. It is slowing the speed at which the weight drops. When people talk about doing a negative, they're referring to taking a heavy weight, sometimes even heavier than they can lift up in the first place, and slowly lowering it down, doing just the eccentric part of the rep. You'll notice a lot of people in the gym when they're doing regular reps look at this portion of the rep as the unimportant part. But this is exactly what part we should be interested in if we're going to determine whether doing heavy negatives gives you an advantage. And wow, diving into this, I had no idea how much research was around on this topic. And the findings, they're pretty incredible. 
First is a study from 1991. They set out to figure out just how important that eccentric negative of a rep really is. The researchers took a group of middle-aged males and divided them into three groups. Each group got a different training program. All three training programs had each group perform leg press and leg extension exercises two days each week. They also all chose a weight which they could only do between 6 and 12 times before failure. One group trained with normal reps that included a concentric and eccentric portion. They pushed the weight up, then lowered it back down under their own power. To figure out how important that lowering eccentric portion was, the researchers developed a special hydraulic device which could take the weight and lower it back down for the participants after they reached the top of the rep. This way, a second group could test out what happens if they only performed the concentric push without the eccentric negative. The thing is though, if the second group is only doing the up part, anyone can see that their muscles would be doing at least a little bit less work. So the researchers did something even more extreme. They took a third group, and instead of just taking away the negative, they made them do a second concentric to make up for it. So what would they find? Would just the up be as good as an up and a down? Surely two ups would be better than an up and a down, right? To measure the change, they poked a hollow needle into the participants' legs, what's called a biopsy, before the training programs began. They trained for 19 weeks, took four weeks off, and then the researchers measured for long-lasting size increases in muscle fiber area. The group that only did concentric, but twice as many reps, increased in their type 2 fiber size by an impressive 27%, which would be more impressive if it wasn't for the fact that the group which just did half of the reps but included the eccentric portion increased in type 2 area by 32%. What's crazy is the group that did the same number of reps, only of the concentric portion, their type 2 fiber area didn't even measurably improve after the four weeks of detraining. As far as type 1 fibers go, only the concentric plus eccentric group saw any size increase, of which fiber area increased by 14%. This study proved that, as crazy as it may seem, it is the negative portion of the rep which is responsible for a greater portion of your muscle growth. So now we know that there is something here and we need to pay attention to the negative. But what would happen if you only performed the negative portion? Well, another study took on that question. One group only did quick one second eccentrics. The other group only did quick one second concentrics. While both groups gained more muscle than a control group who did absolutely nothing, the group that did the eccentrics saw an overall increase of 13% in arm thickness versus the group that just did the concentrics whose arm thickness increased just 2.6% after the eight weeks. How is eccentric only so much better? Well, firstly, it has been proven that you can handle 20 to 50% more weight during a one second negative versus a one second concentric. Without getting too much into it, three things are responsible for muscle hypertrophy, mechanical tension, muscle damage, and metabolic stress. Many studies have asserted that mechanical tension on your muscle fibers is perhaps the most dominant mediator of muscle hypertrophy. You can look at the amount of mechanical tension a fiber is under as the amount of load multiplied by the time under tension. Special sensors on the cells detect this tension, leading to mechanochemical signals being generated and sent, signals which lead to muscle growth. Let's look at the last study again. They kept the time equal, but the muscle was subjected to 20-50% to greater load because the participants could lower down 20-50% to more than they could lift up. More load, same time, greater hypertrophy. It makes sense. By this point, you should be questioning any time when people say that they took their sets to failure. Muscular failure usually occurs during the concentric portion of a rep, but since sets can usually be extended with spotter-assisted negatives, can you ever truly claim your muscle is fully fatigued if you still have some eccentric reps left in the tank? Eccentric reps also recruit more type 2 fibers, which have a 50% greater capacity for growth. 
Well, also, studies have shown that eccentrics lead to more muscle damage, our second factor for hypertrophy. Also, JNK, a signaling module of MAPK, appears to be particularly sensitive to eccentrically induced muscle damage. Lastly, eccentric training is associated with increased metabolic stress, the third driver of hypertrophy. One study reported an elevated lactate buildup and a corresponding spike in anabolic hormone levels after accentuated eccentric training, with the greatest increases noted when the training was at higher eccentric intensities. So now that we are well armed with a solid backing of evidence in favor of eccentric training, what is the best way to implement it into our training? Well, the best course of action might depend on how advanced of a lifter you are. Based on the findings in the 1991 study, we know that at the very least, ignoring the eccentric portion of a rep is incredibly detrimental. So I would recommend that everyone from beginner lifters through intermediate and advanced really focus on holding a tempo on the negative portion of the reps. Treat the eccentric with the same respect you treat the concentric portion since it is responsible for a substantial amount of your gains. For more intermediate and advanced lifters, dedicated spotter assisted sets of heavy negatives which exceed your one rep max concentric strength could be a valuable tool. Beginners might want to stay away from these though since they are incredibly taxing on your neuromuscular system and in the first few months of starting training, the body of a beginner lifter is already making huge adaptations and needs no additional stress. Dr. Brad Schoenfeld, who published a journal article on these specialized training techniques, recommended a minimum of several months of regimented training before attempting techniques such as these spotter-assisted negatives. For those looking to begin training these heavy negatives, a recommendation in the article was to begin with a load between 105 and 125 percent of your concentric one rep max strength. This way, you'll be able to do several reps. Even in advanced lifters, techniques like this shouldn't be overused since part of their effectiveness lies in their ability to overstress the neuromuscular system. Using them too much would also increase the risk of overtraining. I hope you enjoyed that and will be able to bring something new to your next training session. Will the other tricks we're going to look into surprise us too? I guess we'll have to see through the rest of this series. And if you're curious, don't forget to subscribe. Until next time, D-Man, signing off.